Viewers and listeners, welcome to the Carbone Lawyers Law Lab podcast series. My name's Tony Carbone. I'm the managing partner at Carbone Lawyers. With me today, I've got Joseph Carbone, a senior associate at Carbone Lawyers. Good day, Joe. Good day, Tony. Good day, Sam. And Samantha Mercury, an up and coming star in the law. Good day, Sam. How are Hi, you? Hi, Tony, Joe, viewers. Viewers, today we're going to do an episode on superannuation and why it's important. Because what happens is in a lot of instances, we represent people that have got serious injuries that will knock them out of work. And super does become very important because most super policies have got insurance. But we'll deal with that after. At the moment, we're going to talk about what's in the news. Mm -hmm. Now, Joseph, can you tell us some of the facts around this hangover ride in Cairns showgrounds? What happened there? Yeah, so a lady uh, up in Cairns, a 25-year-old lady, um, was on a ride, uh, they call it the hangover ride, which I believe looks like two hammers swiveling around. It sounds like it's absolutely terrifying without anything going wrong. So um, she was on the ride and she actually fell off and sustained some pretty serious injuries when that occurred. So some physical injuries and I'm sure some psychological uh, injuries as well when that happened. Sam... There seems to be a lot of accidents involving these carnivals and rides. And I remember when I was a kid growing up and I used to go up on those, the Mad Mouse and all this. Oh, I'll yeah. tell you what, I'd start thinking twice about these rides. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the amount of accidents that are occurring, and we had that big one in Queensland mm -hmm. where those people died where the boat Dream flipped World. over. Dream World. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what are the rights of these people? I mean, okay, the companies get prosecuted, obviously, for breaches. Mm -hmm. They can sue, can't they? Yeah, absolutely. They've definitely got an entitlement to a public liability claim in this in this instance, particularly this poor woman. Um, in fact, one of the onlookers uh, or the ride that was actually in line to go on the ride next heard the machine operator say that the machine was on a timer and it couldn't be stopped. Oh, wow. So that in itself, I mean, that's... That's bizarre, isn't yeah, it? There should be a safety switch that cuts it out. Absolutely. Correct. There's a duty of care there, and obviously uh, that just gives rise to, to some serious Well, if that problems. was in Victoria, Joe, um, to be able to sue it for public liability, there's some thresholds. You've got to... Yes, there are. You need to, in order to sue for physical injuries, you need to establish more than what is called 5% whole person impairment. And for a psychiatric injury, that threshold is actually 10%. So uh, Unless you're dealing with a back. A back, the law says 5%. Mm. You don't need more than. Yes. Mm. Yeah. And that's and the definition under Victorian law, even though we're talking percentages, they call it a significant injury as opposed to serious injury. Mm. Yep. Correct. All right, look, there's another interesting case. The electrician's that is not the electrician. Yeah, the electrician that got a one point three million dollar payout. What were the facts in this one, Joe? Yes, yeah, so we've got a Mr. Mitchell Robertson of Canberra who was working uh, I believe moving a 400 kilogram switchboard at. Um, uh, stop a minute. How much? A 400 kilogram switchboard. Well, see, yes. I moved a 100 kilo wood splitter and ended up with double hernias. Yeah, that's. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very, risky. very, very heavy uh, piece of equipment to lift. I think there were three of them that were lifting it, uh, even still without any. Uh, All right, stop again. There is no way, no way. That this should be a manual task. No. No, no. Not, not in this day and age. The employer should have had not. appropriate lifting equipment. 100%. 100%. This is negligence 101, mm. isn't it? And it wasn't the first occasion as well. He'd been put in that situation to carry such heavy uh, equipment on more than one occasion. And as it transpires, he got very nasty injuries, didn't he? Yeah, I mean, in many aspects, it's probably not surprising, but sustained some pre pretty significant injuries, which has led to... Him being probably unable to work ever again, um, hence the reason that he would receive such a big payout. It was about one point three million dollars. Which and what was that made up of, Sam? Do you know? Yeah, that was made up of his economic loss um, and which his is loss of income, loss of income, yep. uh, loss of earnings, and he, also the pain and suffering consequences. His loss of enjoyment of life. You know, unable to participate in the hobbies. He's got a four-year-old daughter. So, you know, things like that are all factored into that settlement. In addition to pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life and also loss of income, in Victoria, if you've got a public liability claim and you've got other people doing things for you like shopping, mm. gardening, cleaning, cooking, you can claim that the as care. a gratuitous service. Yes, mm. yes, you can. 
Um, That's a big benefit, isn't it? Absolutely. Yes, most definitely. You know, and thirty dollars an hour, probably one that's also underestimated and and overlooked a lot of the time as well. Yeah, and in fact, that we did a case involving a scaffolding accident where public liability was involved, mm -hmm. and the judge in that one there came back and gave us three hundred thousand just for gratuitous services. Mm. That's right. That's big. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. All right. Now, um, if that was in Victoria, you can rest assured that this employer would be taken through the ringer Absolutely. and prosecuted for. Occupational health and safety breaches, correct? Quite Absolutely. possibly, yeah. yes. And chances are they got prosecuted into state as well. Mm. We've got this really tragic death, Sam, of an 18-year-old electrician. This what one's happened devastating. in this situation? Absolutely devastating. So uh, we've got an 18-year-old subcontractor who was killed on a job site um, when the scaffolding collapsed on him and he was actually trapped under this scaffolding for some 20 minutes to half an hour. Found, investigations were done and it was found that the scaffolding should have been secured by ties um, to the building that had actually been taken off It was off a shoddy undone. job, wasn't it? It was just a shoddy job. Uh, they were trying to, you know, rush. They'd overloaded uh, the scaffolding um, because they knew it was going to be coming down. And unfortunately, this poor 18-year-old boy is, has passed away uh, as a result. I think possibly just as bad is the fact that it was overloaded when, mm. you know, consequences of that as was found in this case mm. could have been catastrophic um so no terrible terrible incident yeah. if he was a bit older and he had say a dependent partner and possibly children that have a dependency claim wouldn't they yeah you'd think so dependency yes most claim. most if not all jurisdictions in australia do have uh, dependency provisions if someone has a dependent usually under 18 years of age um who is now uh unable to receive any sort of assistance from a deceased uh, parent or guardian. Guys, it was tragic. The 18-year-old died because of a major, major breach by the employer. But I'd imagine a family members, that is mum, dad and any potential siblings, would have a claim here. Yep, yep, definitely eligible for a nervous shock claim if they can satisfy the 10% whole person impairment. And that would no be doubt. under the public liability provisions, correct? Yes, that's correct, uh, or whatever provi provision they've got up in New South Wales, which is usually quite similar between the jurisdictions in Australia. It's worth mentioning as well, he would have likely had life insurance, the death cover, um, attached to his policy, his superannuation, and his superannuation policy. policy. Yes. Correct, which they could also claim on as well. And if he had survived, the, the policy would have no doubt had a provision for total and permanent disability, correct? Which no doubt his injury it's sustained, in addition, he would have satisfied yeah. the definition for sure. So he would have been entitled to sue for his damages, mm -hmm. which is pain and suffering, loss of enjoyment of life, loss of income, and also in addition to that, get his total and permanent disability cover paid out. Correct. From the super policy. Yep, totally separate. So there's a number of things we can do here. Plenty. But it doesn't substitute the fact that this poor 18-year-old's been deceased. No, absolutely no. not. And look, realistically, in this day and age, uh, incidents like this shouldn't occur in no. Australia. No. It's amazing how we say it shouldn't occur, but it happens also all too often, doesn't very, it? Very, very often. Yep, yep. And I mean, look, we recently in Victoria, mid-2020, we had the manslaughter laws come in, work for workplace manslaughter. And look, you know, there was a bit of pushback at the time because people were worried about... Uh, you know, prosecutions and whatnot, but if you got cases like and this... And not to mention the Victorian government. Yes, mm. but if you've if you got cases like this, um, I think they're valid, you know, Is it even as a deterrent and also to punish employers that, mm. that uh, perpetrate these types of acts. And this case was a New South Wales case where the uh, penalties are nowhere near as strong as the Victorian. Mm. Uh, so you can right. go to jail for what, up to 20 years under the Victorian laws? Yeah, and it's, yes. and it's a massive fine, million isn't it? Fine, I think, yeah. yeah, for corporations. Mm. But the thing <laughs> is, and that sort of comes brings us back to, you know, we couldn't work out who ordered that hotel quarantine debacle down here. Mm. The reality is no one wants to have their name attached to it because realistically under the manslaughter laws they could be charged, correct? That's right. In theory. There's a possibility, yes. Yeah. So that could be one of the reasons why we can't work out who did what. Mm. Possibly. Possibly. Yeah, we, we're Possibly. speculating here, but mm. anyway. <laughs> uh, Sam, tell us a little bit about why superannuation is so important in a workplace. What, why, is, why are we discussing it today? Well, we're discussing it because there are so many entitlements that are attached to, to policies that workers aren't even aware of in most cases. So, Joe, let me put it this way. At the moment, 
the employer has to pay 9.5% on top of a person's wages, it goes into a superannuation fund. That's correct. But in addition to that? In addition to that, you only not only do you have your superannuation once you retain retirement age, but you also have a couple of insurance provisions in most cases for total and permanent disability. Uh, there's also sometimes a death benefit and also in some policies, income protection, right. which is just an additional level of protection for people that are injured and can't work. And I would hazard to guess that at least 90 95% of superannuation funds would have total and permanent disability income. Yeah, absolutely. It, initially, it was opt-in cover, so you had to opt-in to get that, that insurance attached to your policy. Um, but uh, recently, uh, it, they're pretty much every single time that you become a member, you've got that automatic cover. It's just as to you know whether or not or how much, uh, what level of cover you've got, uh, dependent on the premiums you want to pay. There's a lot to factor in. But One of the major factors that the funds look at mm. is how risky the industry is. Mm. Correct. If you're in a very low-risk job in the sense that you're a desk worker... Mm. Chances are your total and per disability benefits are very high. Correct, that's right. If you're in a, a meat worker or a truck driver, chances are your policy is very small because the risks of you getting injured are very high. Are very high, that's right. And so the insurers factor that in as well. Of course. They? I mean, the, the higher the risk, the higher the chance that they'll have to pay out the policy, which is so what they want to do. what our viewers should know is that if one of you were to come and see us in relation to a work accident and or transport accident, which effectively... Keeps you out of work for at least six months. Most of these policies are triggered at six months, Most correct? Most three to six months, yeah. Then in those circumstances, in addition to any rights you may have under the respective piece of legislation work under the TAC, you might also have a claim for total and disability benefits, mm -hmm. which you can access probably a lot faster than what you can, your work cover all TAC. Yes. Correct. So long as you your practitioners are of the opinion that you satisfied the definition in accordance with your policy, there is no reason why you can't claim. And we specialise in that. Yes, and you should really... One of the key components, a lot of lawyers don't even turn their mind to it. No. But one of the things you should ask every time you do get a new client is let's have a look at your member statement under the superannuation policy mm. you've got. Absolutely. And it's very important that when you do take out the policies with the funds uh, that you're aware of the applicable definition of that policy. All right, let's start talking about one of these cases of Graham and Colonial Mutual Life... Assurance Limited, mm. it's a full Court of Australia decision in yep. 2014. Yep. Who's going to give me the facts? I'm happy to. All right, Sam, <laughs> yeah, you're far away. <laughs> um, so in this instance, it's actually regarding a life insurance claim um, and this was made on behalf of the deceased's wife. Um, so he'd passed away uh, and several years earlier he had uh, taken out cover um, with Cominsure for life insurance. And uh, he thought he'd be a bit cheeky and uh, realised that his uh, accounting business was uh, going down financially and thought he'd set fire to, uh, you know, the computer and, and some of the books and whatnot. And unfortunately, he uh, was caught up in the blaze by accident um, or misadventure, the court will call it, uh, and, and passed away. So his wife uh, then made a claim against the insurance policy and it was rejected on the basis of... Can I stop you there for a minute, Sam? Yeah, yeah. The fact that he's... If it had been deemed that he tried to commit suicide, it would have been... It would have been immediate you rejection. you got no hope? No. 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 Most policies, that's automatic rejection. This guy was just a very bad arsonist. Well, yeah, he, he was trying to set fire to some things and unfortunately the whole premises caught fire and, and he was caught in the blaze and he passed away from smoke inhalation and burns. It's very sad, isn't it? It's it's devastating. It's devastating. Um, so, yeah, they've they've rejected the claim on the basis of um, non-disclosure. He breached his duty to disclose when he took out the application for insurance and uh, that was in relation to alcoholism um, and uh, mental disorders and also fainting episodes. Okay. Joe, in a lot of instances, you don't have to disclose anything because you get insurance automatically. No, that's right. And also, look, I think with this decision, because the court ultimately did uh, decide that 
uh, his failure to disclose or not disclose his fainting episodes was not fatal mm. to the claim. I mean, the important thing is, I think the court has got it right in this instance because the most important thing in this decision is that the court has said that an insurer has a duty to advise a person who's taking out insurance that if there's a non-disclosure of a certain thing, it could be fatal mm. to their insurance coverage. I mean, there's also there's always degrees of conditions. Asthma is not the same as, um, you know, a very serious terminal condition. I'll tell you right. what, they've been very difficult, these funds with asthma. Oh, yeah, mm. they I've, are. I've seen them knock them back. Yeah, yep. Um, Sam, what was the the non-disclosure? I mean, how did they try and – how did the insurer try and link it to – his death. Well, they said that had they known about his extensive medical history, they would not have entered the, poli- the entered the contract, the policy contract with him. They they wouldn't have insured him. But the court found that that actually wasn't the case, and irrespective of his fraudulent non disclosure, particularly regarding the fainting episodes, uh, they still would have uh, insured him. And in, in fact, the the policy was paid out. The court ruled that the policy be paid out. In simple language, Joe. And Sam, if this fell out of died of a heart attack, and one of the things he failed to disclose was the fact that he had pre-existing heart issues, chances are the court wouldn't have paid. Of it. course, correct. I that's mean right. that, that's why I think this is because that's substantive. Decision. The courts call that Co- substantive, correct? Material breach. Yep. Correct. Yep. Yep. Um, so I mean, the lesson really is if you have to disclose, if the policy says you need to disclose. You should disclose, correct? Absolutely. That's exactly right. Absolutely. And the reality is the insurer is going to make you pay a few dollars more. Yes, they will. But at the end of the day, it's worth having that cover. And, peace of mind and as And that well. peace of mind. Um, you must disclose a matter that is known. It's not enough to suspect or believe. You have to yeah. know. Um, and that's what... I'll the tell problem. you what, there'd be a lot of people out there with insurance of varying types that aren't covered. Mm. And a good example is people that take out property damage... Mm. And one of the questions I ask is, you got any prior criminal convictions? And you, and you say no, mm. you're never going to get those paid out. Mm. No. You're better off to disclose. That's right. And they might charge you a bit more. Exactly. It will all come yeah. out. Or you'll find an insurer to cover you. Yeah. It, it, these injuries, it will all come out in your clinical notes anyway. So, guys, we've come to the end of the episode. No worries. Sam, thanks for coming on board. Joseph, thank you. Great thank to see you. you, Tony and Sam. Thanks, guys. Viewers and listeners, thanks for watching. Go to our social media platform, download our episodes. Stream our episodes, uh, stay tuned for future episodes, and always remember to stay safe. Don't say-